This morning, I've entitled my message, Things God Gives Us That Satan Can't Take, But That We Can Forfeit. Things that God gives us that Satan can't take, but that we can forfeit. This morning, I'd like to begin by reading from Romans chapter 15, verses 13. It says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This morning, if you're looking, three of the four points can be found in this one verse this morning. So I want to look at things that God gives us that Satan can't simply just take away from us, but that we ourselves can forfeit. The first of those is our joy. Our joy. In John 15, 11, Jesus is speaking, reading from the New Century Version, and he says, I have told you these things so that you can have the same joy that I have, and so that your joy will be the fullest possible joy. Now, I want to remind you the circumstances of Jesus as he is speaking these things. Jesus is preparing to be crucified. In John 14, he tries to encourage the disciples and tells them, Behold, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I'll come again and take, receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Remember, that's a really famous passage that we use a lot in, in funeral services because it provides comfort and hope for us. But uh, So this is the time that we're talking about. Jesus is trying to prepare the disciples for his death, which is you know right around the corner, but in spite of that, he says to them, I have told you these things so that you can have the same joy that I have and that your joy will be the fullest possible joy. That doesn't sound like something somebody who's getting ready to die would say, does it? And so I would submit to you this morning that this is not just you know, the feeling of joy, but that there's something more to it. I think perhaps part of the reason that we may struggle with this is because we take for granted how good we have it. For some of us, we grew up in the church. We cut our teeth, at least I did, I probably cut my teeth on it front of a church pew. I was born on Sunday, and I'm certain that I was in church the very next Sunday. And I could probably, in the 56 years that I have been around, count on one hand and certainly two the number of times that I've missed church in my lifetime. It's very comfortable for me. It's what I'm familiar with. I've never experienced the other side. Are, are you, do you understand what I'm saying here? Sometimes it's hard for us to appreciate what we've had because we've never been on the other side. When I was in Bible college, I had this mis conception that everybody went to Bible college for the same reason that I did. You know, to learn more about God, to be a good, you know, servant and to be able to be better equipped to tell other people about Jesus. And I got there and I didn't take very long to figure out that that was not true. <laughs> that that was a pretty big misconception that I had. I got there and uh, I get into my room that I'm going to be sharing with my roommate. My roommate's nowhere around. 
Um, and the very first three guys that I met looked like they were part of a gang. <laughs> and I'm like, what have I got myself into? The first guy actually was raised by his grandparents, and grandpa and grandma sent him to Bible college to straighten him out. You know how that went. They, grandma was actually working a newspaper route to help, you know, put him into school. And he took the money that they sent him for his books and bought a pair of Air Jordan tennis shoes. The second guy, I'm fully convinced that was thought he was enrolling in the junior college and accidentally enrolled in the Bible college instead. I, I'm not even sure how that happens, but I think that's probably what took place there. Um, he lasted maybe a semester. John, the first guy, lasted a year, I think. And the third guy that I ran into was Chuck Hamlin, and he ended up being okay. It's just that when he was, he's kind of a burly guy, and when he was with the other two, I thought I was in trouble. Right? But Chuck was really ended up being this amazing guy. He was a twin. And unlike me, who grew up in a Christian home, you know, and cut my teeth on the church pew and sang church hymns and was at vacation Bible school and church camp. And, and you know, he grew up in a very non-Christian home. His mother took Chuck and Henry aside, their twins, and wanted to know if they were gay because they weren't sexually active. Mom would bring home guys and they would, she would be sexually active on a couch in front of them. You know, stuff that I just can't possibly imagine. And... You know, it's by the power of God that Chuck and Henry found a youth group that they became involved with, and it was the gospel that changed them. And unlike me, they have a perspective that I have never seen. Now, I'm not sorry that I was raised in a Christian home. I'm not sorry that I was raised by parents that loved me. I'm not sorry, you know, that I had a great church and a great youth group and all of those things that I had growing up. I don't regret any of those things. But I also need to understand that it skews my perspective. And that I have enjoyed my entire life the good things that the gospel brings. And so sometimes it's hard for me to understand people that have never known that. Sometimes I think that we allow ourselves to give up our joy because we allow the devil to deceive us into thinking that we're missing out on so many other things that we could be doing. In 1 Peter 1, 8 through 9, it says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Sometimes I think that we don't have the joy that we ought to have because we don't have the right perspective. In this verse, the reason for the inexpressible joy that uh, Peter mentions is because of the realization that we are receiving the goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls. That's the reason for the joy. That we understand that we are going to receive eternal salvation. The problem is, is that I think a lot of times the world just grinds us down. 
as we're going through life and the world just kind of keeps grinding against us and it's hard to keep our perspective. It's hard to keep our eyes on what is yet to come, the good things, the great things that are yet to come because it just seems like the world just keeps pressing down on us inexorably and we lose our focus. God intends for us to be filled with joy. If, if we look like we've lost our best friend all the time, does that sound like something somebody who is not a Christian is going to be interested in? I mean, they struggle enough already. If there isn't something out there that they perceive is going to make their life better, why would they possibly be interested in what we have to offer? We're, you know, as Christians, God offers us this opportunity of joy. And the devil can't just take it away, but I think sometimes we voluntarily forfeit it. Because we believe the lies that the devil teaches us that the world has something so much better to offer. Or uh, we just get so distracted that we can't see the goal. The second thing that Satan can't take from us but that we can forfeit is our peace. Our peace. In John 14, 27, Jesus says, I'm leaving you with a gift peace of mind and heart. And the peace that I give isn't like the peace that the world gives. So don't be troubled and afraid. When you were little, did you have this perception that as long as mom and dad were in control, everything was going to be okay? That um, mom and dad would take care of everything, even if we didn't understand what those things were. I remember one time, Andrew, <clears throat> he had broken this toy. I don't even remember what the toy was. And he, he thought that dad could just fix anything. And so he brings me this broken toy, and I'm, I'm looking at this toy, and I'm like, Andrew, I, I can't fix this. This is, like, too broken to be fixed. And he goes, yes, you can, Dad. Yes, you can. Just use your imagination. <laughs> it was this, like, childlike faith that no matter how bad it was broken, somehow Dad could just fix it. It was this this trust that dad could take care of it no matter what the problem was. You know, when it comes to our peace, we can look at the world around us and we can be really troubled by the things that we see. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to change the things that we can change. Because we should. God has, you know, when we accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he didn't just sweep us out of here and take us straight to heaven. That's because he's got a job for us to do. And that's an entirely different sermon. But he expects us to make a difference in the world that's around us. But there are things that we personally can't change that we don't have control over. We didn't have control over the derecho and the destruction that it created. But we could make a difference after it was over with our friends and neighbors and the people that were around us. You know, and I'm really appreciative for, for all of you guys and everything that, I mean, we had some pretty high stress going on there as we were coming into, you know, Bethany's, wedding and there's no electricity and all kinds of stuff and and you guys were really good to us 
And you helped us every, in ways that, you know, um, when we really needed it. But I think part of this idea of peace comes with trusting God with the things that we can't make any difference with, the things that we can't change. This idea of trusting that God is in control and that ultimately, ultimately he'll take care of it. Our problem is, is that we don't have patience. We expect God to take care of it right now. You know, we see evil prosper. We see bad people do bad things. And we think that God should somehow zap them with a lightning bolt. But God's patient because he wants everybody to repent. I'm reminded of a story, a true story that actually happened here about this couple that came to the church looking for help. The guy was bipolar. He was from California. His mom had had cancer or something, and when she passed away, he sold the house, and he took all of the money in cash and rented a limousine for the night and went out and took his wife or significant other or whatever she was, and they went out on the town. And then somebody from the limousine company robbed him because he's flashing all of this cash around. And uh, so they, the, it's, I'm not going to go into the entire story because it's a long story, right? Ultimately, this guy gets arrested. He takes this money from the sale of the house of his mother's and he buys a brand new pickup and this camper that goes into the pickup bed. And he starts traveling across country. And he gets as far as Cedar Rapids or this neighborhood. And um, a tire goes bad on the truck. And he is waiting for, you know, the warranty on the tire because he's on a shoestring. He doesn't have hardly any money left. And he comes to see me. And he is angry. He is so tremendously angry that this person is got letting out of jail, that stole from them. And he, he wants to hurt these people. It's a good thing that that guy is like in California and he was here, right? And then he had just got done telling me how he had in the past done you know, drugs and all of this other stuff and everything. And so as he is ranting and raging, I finally said, I understand that you're upset that this guy got out of jail and you don't you think he should still be in jail. But you just got done telling me all of these illegal things that you have done. I said, where would you be if you got everything that you deserved? And, you know, that kind of brought him up short. It made him stop and think. There's times when we look at the evil that's around us and we think that God should act right now. But maybe we need to sometimes ask ourselves, where would we be if we got everything that we deserved? You know, but for the grace of God, there am I kind of thing. And I think that part of that peace comes with trusting God, even in the things that aren't in our control, knowing that ultimately God is going to set everything right, even though it's not happening in, it, happening in the time frame that we think it should happen in. I have one more verse, or a couple more verses regarding the peace there. Romans 8, 6, it says, If people's thinking is controlled by their sinful self, there is death. But if their thinking is controlled by the Spirit of God, there is life and peace. And then in Colossians 3, 13, it says, And let the peace that comes from Christ 
rule in your hearts, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. And I think that, there's, that this verse is talking about two different kinds of peace. The first peace it says, says there, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. That's mental and emotional peace. Our, our peace that we have. And then the second piece that it talks about there, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and to be thankful. I think that is, you know, not being dissentious. Is that a word? Not dissentious? Is that a word? Not fighting with each other. Okay? That kind of peace. The kind of peace that relates to other people. One relates to myself, how I feel in my own skin. The other one relates to how I'm dealing with other people. In other words, God wants his church to be harmon have harmony and unity and not fighting with each other. I mean, if we want to see fighting and backbiting and bickering, we can go just about anywhere to find that. But if we have unity and love for one another, that's something the rest of the world's going to want. And that's what God calls his church to have, to be unified, to have peace, both internally and how I relate to others. Thirdly, hope. Our hope. Satan, you know, can't take it from us, but we can, we can forfeit it. We can give it away. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 14, it says, And now, brothers and sisters, I want, to, want you to know what will happen to Christians who have died so that you will not be so, full of sorrow like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus comes, God will bring back with Jesus all the Christians who have died. You see, as Christians, we have hope that this life is not the end. We have hope that there's something better in store for us. If I'm not a Christian, then the best that I can really hope for is that when I draw my last breath, I simply cease to exist. If there is no salvation, if there is no heaven or hell, then I might as well live this life and try to get everything out of it that I can because when it's done, it's all over. But see, for the Christian. We have hope. We look forward to something more, something better after this life is over. Paul will write in Corinthians 15 and he will say, if the dead are not raised, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ is not raised, we're still in our sins and we're of all people most to be pitied. Because we have believed this huge lie. But then he goes on to say, but Christ has been raised. And that he is the first fruits of those who have died. And so the body that he was raised with is the kind of body that we can expect to have. That's something to look forward to. You know, when I, was, when I was a teenager, I thought I was invincible. At 56, 
Ah, so invincible. I hurt. I, I have fought with this stupid knee for a year now. I wake up, I hurt. Melanie wakes up and she says, I can't lay in bed any longer. I hurt too bad. You know, I have aches and pains in places I didn't even know existed when I was a teenager. And I can now look forward to a new body. Because this one's starting to wear out. I, I really think it has, a big part of this has to do with God getting us ready for the next step. When Melanie, when we first got married, she's, she's always loved kids. She's loved, she loves the babies. But she was afraid of childbirth. Nine months of pregnancy and she is ready to give birth. Because God gets us ready for the next step. And that happens as we get older as well. And our eyesight isn't as good. And our body isn't the way that it used to be. And we hurt. And we look forward to what's to come because God's getting us ready for the next step. Do we have hope? Because that's what we're called to have as Christians. In 1 Timothy 6.17 it says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Paul says, don't put your hope in wealth, which can be gone in an instant, but to put our hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And then Titus 2.13 where it says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God, and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people who are his very own, eager to do what is good. Don't let, don't give up your hope. And finally, our salvation. Satan can't take it, but we can forfeit it. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says this, I mean that you have been saved by grace through believing. You did not save yourselves. It was a gift from God and not the result of your own efforts so that you cannot brag about it. What it says there is that God's gift of salvation is exactly that. It's a gift. We didn't earn it. We can't. We don't deserve it, is a gift freely given, but we can't be good enough to earn God's salvation. In, there are some churches that will teach that it's impossible to lose your faith. Once saved, always saved. Irresistible grace. If God calls you, you have no choice but to be saved. Um, I think the tenets there are total depravity, ears, uh, unlimited atonement. No, that's not right. Um, I can't remember. Uh, total depravity, irresistible grace, limited atonement, perseverance of the saints, and I can't remember what you was supposed to be. But it's part of that getting old thing again, you know. <laughs> um, they will teach that if you've been saved, it's impossible to ever be lost. Now, we don't teach that in our church because I believe that Hebrews says very clearly that it's possible to forfeit your faith. 
that as long as you have life and breath in your body, you have the ability to choose who you will serve. But in the final analysis, we don't come out that very much different because while we would say that if a person is living like the devil, that they're not saved, one of those people from the other church would say, if you're living like the devil, you never were. You might have thought you were saved, but you never were to begin with. It's, they both would say that that person is lost. One would say that you can be saved and be lost. The other person would say that you'll never act like that if you were ever saved. Does that make sense? Kind of, sort of, maybe? In Hebrews, it says this. Hebrews 10, 26 and 27. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received a full knowledge of the truth, there no longer, there is no other sacrifice that will cover these sins. There will be nothing to look forward to but the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. Even in our society today, we treat people who didn't really know better different from people who knew exactly what they were doing, don't we? So, for example... Uh, with our children, if they mess up and they didn't really know better, we give them more latitude than if they knew exactly what they were doing and they did it on purpose, right? And that's even true in our court system. If you give somebody bad advice and they follow that advice and they get into trouble, well, you just weren't very smart. But if, on the other hand, say you are a psychologist and they give you really, really bad advice that you follow, when they go to court, they're going to be held to a different standard because they know better. Are, are you with me? Hebrew seems to indicate the same thing. It says there that if we deliberately continue to sinning after, and this is where I think the key is, after we have received full knowledge of the truth. If we continue to deliberately sin after we know better, then there is no sacrifice to cover these sins. You see, and he will go on to say in the next verse that I don't have here that we crucify Christ anew. That by continuing to willfully, deliberately sin, we crucify Christ anew. I don't believe that you're saved and then lost and then saved and then lost and saved and lost. You know, I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior and I'm saved. And then I tell a lie and I'm lost. And then I ask Jesus to forgive me and then I'm saved. And then, you know, I, I speed on the highway because I'm late to work and I broke the law so I'm lost. And then I ask Jesus to forgive me and then I'm saved. I don't think it works like that. I, I think that you are either saved or you're lost. And I think what happens is, is that if we continue to willfully sin, we harden our hearts to the point where the Holy Spirit is no longer able to convict us of our sin. And when the Holy Spirit is no longer able to convict us of our sin, we no longer are sorry for the sin that we have committed. And where there is no repentance, there is no forgiveness. Do you follow me? 
I don't think that, that, you know, we're in and out and in and out. And I don't, but if continual, willful, habitual sin will separate us from God. Not because somehow the devil tricked us, but because we made a conscious decision to sin even after we knew better. Maybe you're asking yourself, well, how do I know that that hasn't happened to me already? Well, if the Holy Spirit is still convicting you, then I think that you're okay. It's when we no longer feel any remorse for the sin that we commit, that we're in danger. You see, it's the Holy Spirit's job to lead us to repentance. And if the Holy Spirit no longer is there to do that, there will never be a desire to repent because that's what he does. You know, we have a lot going for us as Christian people. Joy and peace and hope and forgiveness. Don't forfeit those things. Don't give those things away. 